us to Psalm 61. Psalms 61. I'm sorry, Isaiah 61. Thank you. Isaiah 61. We're going to take a look at who God is this morning and some aspects of who he is. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to him that are bound and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of visions of our God to confront all who mourn, comfort all who mourn, and appoint to them that mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I want to skip to seven, verse 7. For your shame he, you shall have double, and for confusion uh, shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be with them. Then I would like to go to verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord of my soul, shall be joyful in my God. And he hath clothed me with a garment of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness. A bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth the bud, and as the garden uh, casts the things that are sown to spring forth, so the Lord shall cause righteousness and praise to spring forth to all nations. There's a lot in that portion. Um, it tells us who God is to us. And uh, it's important that we come to know him and have that intimate relationship so those things become a reality in our life. In the first verse it says, he comes to bind up the broken hearted. How many of you have ever been broken hearted? For years, I have, God has used me to minister to people in dealing with stuff that they don't understand why it is happening in their life. And one of the things I realize that there's things from the past, if they have not been dealt with, a lot of what you do is a result of what's happened that you haven't dealt with. And so one of the things I do is called theophostic ministry, which we ask God to show us where that whole thing started. Because everything in our life, good and bad, has a source and a time that it became a part of our life. And often, it's so amazing, often, that as we wait upon God, God will reveal where something God has placed in your life. Even it's a root of, like if you have a real problem with fear. Often that is rooted in things that have happened that's never been dealt with, and God has never healed your heart. And one of the reasons, that, one of the things that God wants to do in you and I's life is heal our hearts from the difficult experiences that we've experienced. And we all have experienced difficult experiences. However, if you don't let God heal your heart, you're going to act out of those difficult circumstances even when you aren't aware of it. And that's where a lot of the mess that comes in our life comes from. And uh, here the scripture says, God came to heal your broken heart. During my time of ministry of God helping me understand how to take people through those type of situations, 
one day I, somebody, uh, God spoke to me and he said, I want you to pray for them that I will heal their heart. And I never even thought about what a difference that can make. And so one of the things that I do is as I deal with people who have had t tough and terrible experiences and take them to God, one of the, one of the process, part of the process is let's ask God to heal your heart. Now, the memory may not go away, but you won't, if God's healed your heart, you don't feel the pain when you hear it. And God says that he wants to heal Eusenai's hearts. And even this morning, one of the things that I believe God wants to speak to you and I about is allowing God and inviting God to come and heal your heart. And I'm sure every one of us still have things, even though many of us have dealt with a lot of the stuff in our life, many of us have things that we still haven't dealt with. And so whether we like it or not, that thing affects our behavior. So it's very important that we realize that God wants to come and heal our broken hearts. Amen? Okay. And I believe it's really important when you realize you're hurting that you invite God to he touch you. Any of you ever hurt? Oh, you guys are amazing. One person in this whole congregation ever hurts. That's, you guys, you guys, oh, all healed up, wow. Uh, don't forget to join an angel's class. She'll tell you how to do that. Become just like her. <laughs> Um, it's really important when we're hurting that we go to God and ask him to heal our hearts. Yeah. Also, I think often when we go through things, it's important that we invite somebody to go through it with us. Amen. There's something that happens in the spirit realm when we agree and join together that makes a big difference in how things go. So I, I encourage you to look to God to heal your broken heart. He also wants to set at liberty the captive. Now I know you guys, since you guys are the saints you are, that none of you have a problem with addictions except for Sherry. Because she tells us every Sunday about her addiction. Okay? Um, but he says he wants to come and set you and I free from things that rule us that we don't rule. Pardon? Not even, yes, not, yes, not even addictions or whatever. But I just, I, I, here's what God says. He said, I want to set you free from anything that keeps you in bondage. And in this passage that we're looking at this morning, he's telling you and I what he wants to do in our life. And if you've never thought about the fact that God wants to set you free, he does. I, I heard the story about my dad one day uh, when he came, after he came to Jesus, he, uh, he wanted to be set free of smoking. And so one day they had an altar call and he came up and he took the altar, uh, went to the altar and said, God, I want you to set me free. He said, the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart, well, put the cigarettes on the altar. And so he did that. And the amazing thing was, God set him free from smoking from that moment on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, a lot of people say, well, smoke and send you to hell. Probably not, but it sure it could get you to heaven a whole lot sooner. Okay. I, I don't believe, personally, I don't believe smoking is a sin. I believe it's a very unwise choice. Okay. And of course, even... Our, even our culture in all of its sickness realizes that smoking is not a good idea. Yeah. Okay? Um, but God says he wants to set us free of everything that binds us. So if you have something that is controlling your life, 
and keeping you in bondage? God invites us to say, come and set me free. Because he said, I will set you free. Have you had any God set you free of anything? I certainly have. One of the biggies that are out there is fear. Even this morning, it was interesting. Um, when Stacy was sharing, she said, you know, I've struggled with being afraid, and yet during the storm, she realized God was with her and went to bed. She didn't tell you the whole story. After she got done praying, she went to bed, went to sleep, and stayed asleep until she early until the morning. Okay? What happened? She invited God into the situation, and God set her free from fear. God wants to set you free of anything that keeps you in bondage. And I just encourage you, I'm telling you what God does, is, wants to do for us so that you and I will respond and give him an invitation. Listen, God does not butt into your life. He has given you a free will. And if you want God involved in your life, it's really important that you invite him into that situation. And he can set you free where you may not be able to get yourself free from the mess you've got yourself in. Let me tell you something. He said to us, listen, I came to set you at liberty. And so it's important that you go. And once again, you'll hear me say it again. Of course, if you know me very well, I believe that we need to have people that we're accountable to, that we uh, stand with us through things. As all of you know, Mike Bihar is my primary guy that I meet with uh, every week. And there is something, a power in two that isn't there. The Bible says, if any two or three agree, it will be done. I encourage you, don't go through things alone. It's no fun you know, to, to get a brand new car and have nobody to celebrate with you, right? right? If you ever want somebody to celebrate, let Barneys come. <laughs> if you get a new something or whatever, she just knows how to celebrate. You know that little high pitch, whee, dancing up and down, and she's just as happy as if it happened to her, okay? So if you want to celebrate, she's a good one. Okay? But in all, in all reality, listen, we were not made to do life alone. Amen. And so, as you're going through things in life, good and bad, it's important. You have people you surround yourself with and make yourself accountable. I happen to have several. I'm a really tough character. So I have several people I meet with throughout the week. And uh, in the case, Mike, James, and I get together even just to be accountable to challenge each other and encourage each other. So whatever you're going through, if it's, especially if it's bondage, that you let others stand with you and go to God with. He says, I, uh, and to open of the prison of them that are bound, once again it's talking of bondage, and to proclaim the accepted day of the year, uh, who will, day of vengeance of God. He says, I will comfort those who mourn. One of the things that uh, I pray for when people are going through difficult times is that God will send the Holy Spirit to comfort, just like yeah. Russ. This morning when I prayed, I said, comfort him. Because God can comfort you when nobody else can and he said, I will give you, I, I'll send the Holy Spirit, the comforter, to be with you. And so, we don't have to go through life alone, right, Stacy? Don't have to go through life alone. And God says he wants to come and comfort you as we go through difficult things. Uh, as much as Marie being in heaven, it, it means to Russ, he is going to miss her. Because he has spent about 20 years of his life with her having all kinds of health problems and taking care of her. And so basically she's taken almost 
up his whole last 20 years of his life. Now she's not going to be there. What's going to happen? He's really going to miss her. Okay? And yet God says if we will invite him, he will comfort us. He wants to comfort us. So that's another thing that God wants to do for us. The next thing it says in verse 3, it says, I want to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for heaviness. God invites you and I to take those things which are destructive and exchange them for his beauty. Now one of the things that we are, have a tendency to do, I find some, there's a lot of people that are hesitant to let go of things. Because Stacy could have held on the fear even after she prayed, but she had to choose to give that fear to God as God gave her peace. And one of the things that I realize that so often we fail to realize that we need to let go of those things which bring destruction in our life and give them to God. Whether it be anger, I know none of you get angry, but uh, anger, giving anger to God and say, God, I give that to you. I will not, I'll let you deal with that situation when and however you do, but I release that anger to you. I'm going to walk in love. Amen? Amen? Any of you ever have to do that? Oh, oh, both of you. That's good. There's at least two of you that do. And, and God says he wants to make the exchange and yet at times we refuse to let go of an offense that somebody has made to us and wonder why we don't take on the beauty of Christ and his love. Listen, if you want to become all you can be, it is really important you learn how to forgive. Amen. How many of you have wrestled with forgiving? Yes. And we will all be offended. Do you know that you and I need to be offended? Because we will never learn to become like Christ if we aren't. Because he forgives and we have to learn how to forgive too. But if we're going to be like him, when he taught the Lord's Prayer, what he said, forgive me even as I have forgiven others. Even, by the way, even as God has forgiven me. And so, if you and I want to be free to take on the beauty of God, we must let go of injustices, of anger, and we could go on. There's a whole lot of things the enemy wants to get you caught in a trap which will destroy your life. If you refuse to release it and let God heal your heart, it will destroy your life. Even injustices. Anybody ever had an injustice happen? You know, I, in studying the Word of God, there's a few of things that God has done that I felt were not just. Have you ever talked to God about injustices? Yeah. Uh, we happen to be reading um, Samuel and studying Samuel. And we just talked about where the Philistines released the Ark of the Covenant on a cart and it went up and came into one of the fields and they did sacrifice, they celebrated the presence of the Lord or in their midst and all that and then God slays I think it was 75,000 people or something like that why? Because they were not supposed to look upon the ark. And they did. 
And I said, God, that's, they were happy to see you. They were celebrating your goodness. And you turn your back on them and slay them? That doesn't sound just to me. I know you wouldn't think like that, would you? By the way, there's a good reason he did. He taught us reverence. Yes. And he said, you need to reverence me because it's life and death. And they were told they were not supposed to look up on the ark. And in their excitement and all the thrill of having the ark of the covenant back, they lost their reverence for God. And I know, we, I know we don't talk about reverence in America because that's, you know, we are free to do whatever we want. Let me tell you something. We need to learn to reverence the yep. Lord. Okay, good. At least one person agrees. The rest of you, God will lead you down the path to teach you to reverence him. Nothing bothers me more than I, I, one of my pet peeves is when I hear a Christian use God's name vainly. Oh, God! We're talking about word when I'm talking to him. And, and here they are. Do you realize that dishonors God? Honor God in how you use his name. Amen? And so... Yes, there are what we see as injustice, but I'll tell you one thing. When I saw that in the Word and it bothered me, you know what I know? I know I'm wrong and he's right. God is always right and he is just. And what he did was just because he was teaching them to dishonor me will bring destruction to you. And it will still in our lives, by the way. Dishonoring God will bring destruction to you. And so God doesn't want you to dishonor him because it's not what's good for you. Amen? Amen. All right. So God says he wants to give us uh, beauty for ashes. And he wants to give us a joy for mourning. He wants to give us praise for heaviness. And so God wants to set us free so that we will be joyful and and cheerful and so on so he invites you and I to invite him to come and set us free from everything that bondages gives us bondage and blocks us from having that kind of a walk with him I, I jumped a few verses because I, verse 7 is one that is really important for us to know and hear it says for your shame you will have double. For confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. And it says, and they shall ha possess double, and everlasting joy will be with them. There's another verse I think I'll get to. It comes, well, let's take a moment and look at it. Can we turn to uh, the book of Joel? And it's, in my Bible, it's page... 1341. I know on your phones it's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to take a look at um, verse 25. Pardon? Chapter, I'm sorry, thank you, good question. Two. Actually, we can... Um, Start 23. And he will cause to come down uh, to you the rain, the former and the latter rain, in the first month. And the floor shall be full of vats. And I will, verse 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, that the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palm worm, my great army, I will send amongst them. Basically, he's saying, I'm going to restore to you all that Satan has robbed from you. One of the people that really uh, impressed me 
um, is Joyce Meyer. She is just a phenomenal woman, but it's interesting that she started off having a really tough life. How many of you know her story? Okay, I don't need to tell it to you. I'll just give a brief thing. She was raised in a home with, with her father sexually abusing her and a lot of other type of abuse too. And, uh, and as, as a result of that, when she got older, she was ashamed, she felt shame. And so she couldn't imagine anybody wanting her or, or uh, loving her or any of that. And so if you know her story, she went through a whole process that God took her of restoring her and delivering her from the shame. And God set her free to where she has had many other women who have suffered similar things, help them to get free of the shame and all the stuff that goes along with that. Unfortunately, by the time the average woman is 18, nearly 70 to 80% have been sexually abused. And that's a really sad statement, but it's a reality in our culture. Unfortunately, sexual abuse towards men has gone way up too. They say it's between 50 and 60% of men have been sexually abused today by the time they're 18. We're a really sick culture. Aren't we? Yes, we are really sick. However, here's what God says. He says, listen, I'm going to take the shame that was meant to destroy you. Because I'm Joy to... said, I would be the Christian that I am today, in love with God the way I am today, had I not had to work through all of that stuff. Right. Amen. Right. And so she is double the person in knowing God. Yes. Double in all the other areas. Why? God says, I will give you double for your trouble. And you, listen... Shame is a trap of the enemy. And, and, and the enemy wants us to act in shame because it will keep us from being free to be who God made us to be. And make you think nobody wants to hear you, nobody wants anything to do with you. You know, you're a terrible person. By the way, what did Joyce do wrong? Nothing. And you and I, when we're talking about justice, we say, how could God ever let her stay there in that circumstance? Well, first of all, her dad had a free will, whether he would do what he should or not. And he chose to use her wrongly. And I know you have a hard time understanding that, but you know what? We can't love if we don't have a free will to not love. And so God made us so we can love him and love others. And so he gave us a free will, and that free will can be used for the wrong things. Yep. And that's what happened in that case. Okay? However, God was with Joyce. And he said, I'm going to show my power to heal and restore and to bless. And there's very few people, at least in America, and by the way, many other nations as well, that haven't heard her name. You know why? Because of what happened to her that brought shame. God took that shame that Satan meant to destroy her with and drove her into a relationship with God which is so resounding. And the message that she has of freedom and healing and deliverance is so strong and so powerful that she has double for the trouble she had. But God walked her through it. And listen, you may be going through a tough time right now, but I just want to say, you need to hear what Stacy said. If you don't remember anything else, remember what she said when she began to pray to God and say, I don't want to be alone. What did God say to her? You're not alone. God is with you. 
And the reason I'm talking about these things this morning is because if we don't realize God invites us to bring these things to him, we can stay stuck the rest of our life, even though God is willing to deal with these things in our life that we need to be set free from. And Joyce Meyer has gotten double for her trouble. And by the way, I love the fact that he goes further than that. He said, I will give them an everlasting joy. Listen, he doesn't just stop with fixing it. He wants to fill us with that hopeful expectation, with that knowing of who God is and what he is. And he says, I will give you a joy that goes along with it. And one of the things with Joyce, you know, that she just chooses to enjoy life. But she could never do it had she, listen, had she not been willing to give her shame to Jesus in exchange for his beauty and glory. For those of you who still struggle with shame and have never addressed it and never gone through it, I'm not going to try to do a teaching of any sort this morning, but I want to say something to you. Jesus, the pictures you see of Jesus are not accurate. Let me tell you one that's not accurate. A number of years ago, we had a black pastor we got to know, a woman pastor, and and. She had a church that she had built, got the shell up, but couldn't finish it. So we joined with her, and we finished to com complete the church with her. And uh, we went for the dedication. And I went into the bathroom, and on the wall, I saw Jesus on the cross. And I knew that they were confused because Jesus was black. And we all know Jesus is olive. Of course, in my mind, Jesus was white. However, there was something else that was incorrect. He had a cloth over himself to be decent. Listen, Jesus died naked to suffer our shame. So we can have joy and freedom to enjoy things to the full. Listen, Jesus died for your shame so we can be free from shame once again it's important you invite him into that situation and do it with somebody else if you're struggling with shame because we've all listen if if you've done anything that's ever been shameful I'm gonna put two hands up I know there's only two of you with hands up but I'll put two up because I have I've done several things that I was shameful for. The cool thing is, I can go to God and confess that I was wrong and that it was sin, and, and, and he will forgive me, and I can be free to enjoy life. And most of you know my story. When after I'd been married five years, I left my wife for six months. That's nothing to be proud of, but you know what? I'm not ashamed of it. Why? Because I went to God and asked him to forgive me. And he suffered for my shame. And I asked my wife to forgive me and my kids to forgive me and so on and so forth. But listen, he took your shame for you. You don't need to walk in any longer. Amen? Amen. Yes. And it's, it's the good news this morning. I'm preaching a lot of good news. Amen? Yes, it's the good news. Um, I love verse 10. It says, And he's clothed me with a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. How does God see you? How does he see you? Yeah. As you are without fault. And he looks at you with great joy because you're his sons and daughters. If you've accepted Jesus into your life, listen, you will become his sons and daughters. If you haven't accepted Jesus in your life, it's important you do. Yeah. 
because all of this becomes yours. All of it, we can be free, we can be all the other things we said. And he says, he gave us righteousness as a robe. I want to, you know, you can say this is the Old Testament, by the way, it is the Old Testament. But I, as I wrap things up today, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. I know, you're, you're on your phones, you can't turn. Alright, and I'm almost to Luke chapter 4. Um, by the way, I just want to tell you that more and more people are going back to paper books. And, and, and probably one of the most important people that you know uh, has done it that is phenomenal that went to the phones and computers uh, long before most of us and that's my son has actually gone back to a paper Bible he says I, I, read my robot I realize he said I, I realize I get so much more out of it I never thought I'd hear my son say that because most of his job probably 80 percent of his job is spent on the p computer <laughs> and yet he's saying okay Luke chapter 4 Let me find the verse. Can we, 18, right? Is 16? Uh, okay. James, why don't you go ahead and read that? 16 through 19. And when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for the reading. Who is he? Jesus. Jesus, very good. <laughs> Wow. It was in the Old Testament too. It's also for us in the New Testament that God wants to do the same thing for you and I as he did for the people back in the Old Testament. I just pray that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you to apply what we've just read this morning and get freed up to be all you can be in God. Amen? Amen. To be all you can be in God. And the Satan will not keep you or I in bondage one more day. Amen. 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 For all of us, right? Amen. Yes. And the good thing is, Luke, Luke that uh, died what, a week ago, or whatever it was, we see him as a testimony. Yes. By the way, yes. does, does he have to walk in shame? No. Don't have to walk in shame, do we, Luke? No. Why? Jesus paid the price so you can be free of shame. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Pardon? No. No, the hard way is to walk in shame. The enemy wants to keep accusing us, keep blaming us, and that's a lie of the enemy because when he does, all you got to do is say, Jesus already forgave me. So I forgive me. You have to, you have to keep, keep doing it. Listen, you have to keep forgiving yourself. Yeah. Is there anybody here that hasn't sinned? Just not Luke? Oh, I forgot. We have one that hasn't sinned, I said. There's, we had a couple raise their hand. I, I, only, I only say that because is there anybody going to judge him for his sin? How could we? Who's without sin? The enemy wants you to believe 
that everybody that sees you is judging you. It's a trick from the pit of hell to keep us from walking in the freedom that Jesus bought for us. Amen? Amen. Yes. There's not one of us that have not sinned. And by, by the way, you know, I've heard some people um, say, oh, but their sin is so terrible. Just let me ask you a question. Ask me this question. Is there any good sin? Oh, good. Then they're all bad. Right? They're all bad. There's no good sin. And so when we feel like, you know, in prison, one of the things they do is if somebody has been a child molester, all these people that are in prison for all kinds of sin are out to do in the child molester, saying that's the worst sin you can commit and makes my sin look good. Listen, there is no good sin. That, it's called sin because God knows it isn't good for us. And so therefore, he says, don't do it. Amen? So... There's no good sin, there's no, uh, but however, there's forgiven sinners. Amen. Amen. God, today, we rejoice in who you are to us. In what you want to do and what you want to accomplish in setting us free to be all that you made us to be. The fact that you want to give us double for our trouble. God, will you bring this back to each one of us? what the truth is of what you want to do in our lives and help us to walk that out in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, for being so good to us. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives and that you will finish that good work which you have begun in Jesus' name.